Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Karim Hagay. I'm the director of the Center for American Studies and Research. Uh, together with my colleague, Professor Robert Mason, who heads our Middle East Studies Center, uh, we are very happy to sponsor this talk and to welcome uh, Dr. Thomas DeLuca uh, from Fordham University, uh, who is with us today. Uh, to talk to us about a very uh, central and timely subject uh, regarding uh, the United States uh, and China. Um, Professor DeLuca is the director of the International Studies Program and the Sino-American Seminar on Politics and Law uh, at Fordham University. His main interest is in the theory and practice of democracy in the U.S. and abroad. Professor DeLuca specializes in American politics, democratic theory and practice, and civil and political rights. Since teaching in China from 1999 to 2000, he has become interested in Chinese politics and society and in comparative democratization, and since the events of 9-11 also in the area of terrorism. Uh, Professor DeLuca served as the 2005 to 2006 Thomas Jefferson Distinguished Fulbright Chair in American Social Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Professor DeLuca is also a regular commentator uh, in the media on issues related to U.S. China uh, relations, uh, both television and uh, print media. So it gives us great pleasure to have uh, Professor DeLuca uh, here with us today to talk to us uh, on the uh, title of his talk today, which is Donald Trump meets Xi Jinping, Great Power Exceptionism uh, and the World. Now obviously uh, this is an issue that touches on one of the most important bilateral relations uh, in today's international politics. United States and China, and Professor DeLuca approaches this from a very interesting aspect of political culture uh, and, uh, and domestic politics. Um, so Professor DeLuca, it's wonderful to have you uh, with us. Uh, thank you for your time, and we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. First, let me thank Professor Kareem Magai and also uh, Ms. Yasmin El Ghazali, I didn't pronounce your names close enough, uh, for this warm welcome. It's been terrific. Before I started on this topic, I just wanted to make one comment, which was that my interest in China uh, started when I taught there as part of the Fulbright program, uh, the, the, the American Fulbright program, um, which gave me the opportunity to really see something that I'd never seen before, something really new. And I'm so happy now to Hopefully, we haven't had some exact experience here in Egypt, which is new for me, and I'm very, very interested uh, in uh, being here. Um, and, uh, and so, um, in my mind, this is, uh, you know, just my China experience for me was open new worlds and opened up new avenues of cooperation. I'm really hoping that this will, uh, I'm confident this will have the same effect, so I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, my, uh, what I'm going to try to do today, relatively briefly, is talk a little bit about the uh, U.S. and China and the idea of, of exceptionalism, and in particular reference to two very uh, particular leaders of each of these countries, Xi Jinping, of course, and Donald Trump, I'm the uh, president. Um, the the um, most basic thing, of course, is that as China has grown more powerful, um, uh, the relationship with the United States has moved from one of, which was largely one of cooperation for a variety of reasons over many years, to one of much greater uh, competition. And this competition is now, as you can see, these are just some of the avenues uh, this competition is taking uh, place. Um, and this is an example here, economic competition, asking this question, which one of the following do you think is the world's leading economic power? I imagine if we'd gone back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we wouldn't have even had a chart like this, right? The United States would have been clearly the dominant economic power in the world. And now you can see that um, you know, Germany and Sweden, 
Netherlands, Canada, UK, the countries the United States has a very good relationship with, see uh, uh, China as being more economically powerful than the United States. These are people from these countries. And uh, again, whether this is true or not is, is not the point, right? Whether China's actually more economically powerful. The point of the perceptions and the nature of the competition between the two countries. Um, this competition, uh, of course, has material roots uh, based on economic self-interest, but also is driven by ideas. And uh, one idea in particular I'm going to focus on in this talk is the idea of exceptionalism, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, with regard to uh, what I would consider to be an American version of American exceptionalism and a Chinese version of uh, Chinese exceptionalism. Um, the idea of exceptionalism really comes out of the United States, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea that can easily be, put, be applied to any country that views itself in a very, very uh, special way. Um, one of the reasons why this is important is because um, as the competition between the United States and uh, China heats up, there's always the danger of, that, of it turning into, uh, you know, at worst, a military conflict. And it's not, uh, not impossible. The US and China already fought one major war back in the 1950s. Of course, conditions are very, very, very different now. And I just remind us, uh, as many have pointed to, the idea that we need to remember uh, you know, World War I was a war that uh, probably few people would have predicted. And uh, you know, some would argue it didn't need to happen. But it did happen. And millions and millions of people were killed in this war. And one of the, one of the points here is uh, that, um, um, as I'll get to, that um, this war was between countries that had very similar cultures, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, some of you may have heard of uh, Grant Allison, who's really recently written about the calls of the Sydney's trap, the danger of a rising power and the threat that a, uh, that a, uh, um, a dominant power may feel from that rising power. Uh, this comes from the historian uh, Sydney's idea that uh, the Peloponnesian War was caused by the friction between the rising Athens and its allies and the dominant power of the time, Sparta, uh, leading to this very uh, important uh, war. And um, we saw something like that happening that had been a rise in Germany and an established Great Britain, at least that's the argument it goes, back in 1914. Um, so you can see what Allison writes here. The past 500 years have seen 16 cases where a rising power threatened to displace a ruling one, 12 of them ended in war. That's what he calls the the city of this trap. And he says those conditions are present today in US-China relations. And he concludes that on the current trajectory, war between the US and China in the decades ahead is not just possible, but much more likely than currently uh, recognized. And of course, again, all of this is debatable, but I think it's worth paying attention to. I'm not convinced that the situation is as dire that, uh, as Allison argues, but it's certainly uh, one that has potential danger to it. Um, the Great War in Europe, as I mentioned before, that is World War I, before they started numbering those wars, it's called the Great War. Uh, nobody could imagine it would be an even worse war that was down the road some 20 something years uh, later. Um, show, it just shows you how important political culture, uh, uh, to understand political culture and leaders may be, because the Great War, was um, fought between literally distant cousins, at least some of the participants in the Great War. So if you could follow this, I'm not here to film the trees, but some of you maybe could, could follow this, the relationships between the monarchs of these major powers, or cousins, or grandchildren of each other, right? And here, uh, this is actually quite interesting. I hope I got this right. The, uh, in 1913, when did the war break out? 1914. This is 1913, this photo taken, where the English king was wearing a German uniform, and the German kid, Kaiser, is wearing a British uniform. They're cousins. And uh, do you see a war on the horizon here? Now, I just remind everybody, right? Of course, the point here is simply that if you can have a war that gets out of control in this way between people who are literally related to each other, with 
relatively similar cultures, that you know, the danger would be uh, uh, magnified, at least to some degree, by the fact that you have you know, the American Chinese culture being different, very different styles of leadership, very different histories, and, and all, all the rest of it. Therefore, the complication between the US and China, we need to pay I think, some special attention, not just the conflicts of interest, as, for example, the realist school of international relations would suggest, but also to tensions between different ways uh, of seeing the world. And this brings me uh, to the idea of political culture and American exceptionalism. Um, I'm not going to spend very much time, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But the idea of political culture is simply you know, the values, beliefs, uh, um, and the needs of societies uh, with regard to how they think they should be organized politically. Why they think their way of organizing the world is the right way to do that. And really it has to do with the way a culture a uh, identifies itself politically. The identity of the culture. The identity of uh, people as political uh, people. And of course, in many ways, the U.S. and Chinese political culture is quite different. And here's just uh, you know, a couple of sort of talking points. And we spend a lot of time on all of this, but you know, today we're uh, not going to. But you know the, the American story of being liberal, uh, uh, originally being free enterprise, uh, Republican, um, uh, individualist orientation, Chinese having the dual influence of Chinese traditional culture, Confucian, among other things. Also, it's Marxist heritage. Uh, for example, the way the state is organized now is you know, some regards on, on uh, Leninist, or even, well, in some ways, Maoist, I would say, even more Leninist lines embedded to the, uh, to the uh, old Soviet Union, uh, and the culture and the political system being more collectivist, at least in orientation in the American system. Each claiming uh, uh, democracy as a, as a goal, the U.S. thinks it has it, the Chinese think they're working for it, they're developing a true kind of democracy. This is just some sort of high points, where we're talk uh, talking points that we have very interesting discussion about political culture, but some fundamental differences potentially between these political cultures. Now, one thing these cultural political cultures share is that they share the idea that they're special. Right? I mean, we think we're special as Americans, and I know Chinese think they're special. And you know, this comes out in all kinds of ways. If you can go to China and come, and come back without having somebody tell you um, uh, how ancient your civilization is, you know, you've done something unusual. Uh, of course, in America, uh, you've had this, um, uh, you know, this you know, relatively rapid rise as a, as a sort of culture, probably all, uh, sort of an economic system, probably only taking Great Britain by 1900 in, in many important ways, and, then, uh, uh, and probably peaking at, uh, at sometime after World War II in terms of economic, political, and military uh, uh, power. So uh, both countries have this narrative about their exceptionalism, and I, which I want to talk a little, a little bit about that now. I just I want to focus on, on here right here on one point, which is on the bottom of this, of this slide. Uh, well, two points. One is that the idea of exceptionalism isn't just that a country is, you know, is powerful, or great, or strong, but that it has a, a unique role to play in history that nobody else can play. And I, I, I think that both China and the U.S. have made claims like that at various points in history. I think actually the Chinese are doing that right now. And America has done that for at least since, well, probably going back quite a ways in American history. Um, so for, one, for example, um, one, one relatively recent example of that is the Cold War, the so-called leader of the free world, that yeah, only America can play this role. Even recently, Barack Obama said something to that in the American to play this role. Now again, whether any of this is literally true or not is a different story. What we're talking now about is how a culture and uh, the political identity of a people is, uh, is self-identified. That's the critical thing. Now, now whether this is uh, true or not. And then and also the, the idea here that a country is exceptional, um, is, uh, excuse me, that it's a country uh, is not exceptional because it's powerful. It's exceptional because that's in the nature of the country. So in the American example, some would think this comes from God or from providence or from nature. Right? Um, power comes from that. But the exceptional quality is something 
uh, endemic to the, to the cultures as the power flows from them. It's not that the country is exceptional because it's powerful. It becomes powerful because it's exceptional. Um, and so please keep this in mind so I don't get into, uh, I want to be politically correct here. Uh, to, to make these arguments, especially about my own country or, or about China, is not to endorse the idea of exceptionalism. But, it, but it, these are real views held uh, in both countries, I think. And uh, um, I think there, there, I know in the United States things that get debated. It's not that everyone has one group by, by any stretch of the imagination. Probably younger generations are less enamored with this idea that polling shows than older generations. But nevertheless, it's a real thing that. So, okay, American exceptionalism. So, the idea that the U.S. was given by providence or God a special role to play in the world. It was to be a city on a hill, a beacon, a shining beacon. There will be a guide for other countries. So imagine these Puritans coming over to this so-called new world and uh, having to have some strong reason for having to make this crazy, very difficult trip. And so what they were doing was establishing something in their mind, something new. Of course, a lot of that in those days was very religiously motivated. It wasn't just to get away from oppression, but it was actually to create your own religious identity here, and then actually oppress other people so if they weren't Puritans. But that's a, probably another story for another day, right? But the idea that um, we're going to be free from the corruption of Europe, something new, um, no feudalism here, no inequality because it's limitless land, limitless frontiers, uh, abundance, uh, a beacon to mankind. Okay. Now, of course, a lot of this is an exceptionalism narrative um, develops from, you know, these something newly created and then developing over time uh, into this great powerful nation. And of course, a lot of this whole uh, exceptionalism idea ignores in many things, for example, genocide, against Native Americans in the United States, slavery, the American Civil War, and we could go on and on, misogyny, and, and, uh, and so on. Racism, we're still fighting these battles. But of course, the exceptionalism narrative, as most myth-making narratives, uh, it, it elides those kinds of troublesome historical facts. Um, to protect its unique uh, character, America's first president, George Washington, uh, famously in his uh, farewell address, warned America not to get entangled with the Don't get entangled with that corruption. We have to focus on establishing this republic here. And Jefferson thought we could become an empire of liberty that would be also a guide to the world. Lincoln had a similar idea. While well, they thought America and exceptionalism should be by example, we have much more muscular versions of American exceptionalism. The Monroe Doctrine, when um, President Monroe warned Europe to stay out of Latin America. Now, we didn't actually have the wherewithal to keep them out at that time, but the British did, so uh, that, that sort of worked accidentally. But still, this idea this is America's role, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this. Manifest destiny, the U.S. had, you know, it was given by God, the providence of nature, the right, whole American continent, westward expansion, Native Americans in the way, Mexicans in the way, the idea that America was entitled uh, to this. Uh, world War I, famous catchphrase, make the world safe for democracy. Uh, world War II, it's not there, but uh, arsenal of democracy. Um, right up to the war on terror, when uh, George W. Bush claimed that the uh, barbarous attack on New York by Al-Qaeda was executed because they hate our freedom. This was, this was the argument being made. Um, of course, this was not, uh, uh, I was in New York that day, so I remember this very clearly. But th these were not the reasons that were actually given by Al-Qaeda, but it was used as, a, as, the, uh, as an idea. One of the reasons why, I mean, why, one of the reasons why the U.S. had to engage in this global war on terror, which eventually led to the American, not just invasion of, of, of Afghanistan, but Al Qaeda was, but to Iraq um, for uh, other reasons. Um, 
We were told to stop weapons of mass destruction, also to stop terrorism. There were, as you know, no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Al-Qaeda and, uh, and uh, Iraq had nothing to do with each other, uh, nothing positive to do with each other. But then the idea that by doing this, we can also help establish democracy in the Middle East. And this is where we really get to the idea of American exceptionalism. This idea that we can promote freedom throughout the world, and uh, this sort of neoconservative idea has been much debated in the United States. And the Iraq war has now helped discredit, but it keeps popping up, popping back up. But again, this idea that we can promote freedom through this kind of, uh, among other things, through this kind of uh, activity. Um, so in other words, there, when I say American exceptionalism, there have been more uh, uh, kind and gentle versions of it. There have also been much more muscular versions of it. So all Americans, again, are not in one piece with this idea. But they are, they do agree on the specialness and the role that the U.S. I can play. This is just a post here um, about uh, nine or about the war against Chairman Twilight, TWAT. Okay, now American exceptionalism gets debated in the United States, and uh, President Obama, soon after he took office, got into some trouble over the idea of American exceptionalism in the following way. You see, you see the quote on the top? I believe in American exceptionalism, he said. Just as I suspect the Brits believe in British exceptionalism, and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. Well, of course, what conservatives argue is if, if, if you're saying that, that means you don't believe in it. Because what American exceptionalism means is the U.S. is unique. It's not like everybody gets to be exceptional in that way. Sure, everybody has a great culture and so on. When we talk about exceptionalism, uh, uh, American exceptionalism, that's different. That has to do with the unique role the U.S. can play in history. And he was really taken to task for that. And he actually uh, backed off, as you can see down here, uh, backed off later, saying, here's my bottom line. I believe in American exceptionalism. America must always lead on the world stage if we don't, no one else will. So you kind of, you get less of a multiculturalist for that moment to, to avoid that criticism. Now one thing that's very interesting is Donald Trump has actually also criticized the idea of American exceptionalism, but he never, he never got, he didn't get taken to task for it by conservatives, probably because of, you know, his idea of America first, and big America really. But we'll talk about that. There he is. Okay, make America great again. Well, right for President, I don't think it's a very nice term. I think you're insulting the world. What do you think? So that's, what, that's what Donald Trump, honestly, I'm honest with you, when I first read this, I was surprised. Right? Unlike Obama, though Trump has not been taking the task for those comments because of, you know, again, probably because of his makes a conservative, the conservatives who went after Obama are in alliance with Trump, and also he's got these other sort of muscular sounding terms. Recognizing? Now, I just found this on the internet. I think somebody's sell, uh, selling this. Here. Tell me if this is correct. I, I mean, I have no idea. I was a little afraid to put this up there today. You know, I could be saying anything. I have no idea. Okay. So, okay. Oh, God, please, no. <laughs> no, I think that, I, you know, I wasn't going to, I didn't spend a lot of time, but I wasn't clear if somebody was putting that up there because they wanted it to sell that hat, to be inclusive of Muslims in the idea. That's what it said on the website, to be inclusive of Muslims in this idea of making America great. Um, so what is Trump's view? Why do I still think, in spite of what he said with his own words, why do I still think he believes very strongly in American exceptionalism? In Trump's view, America was once great, and with the right leadership can be great again. The right leadership, of course, is, as you know, Donald Trump. Um, so what happened to America's greatness? If America was great, what happened to it? Well, it was stolen from us. By whom? Incompetent leaders. For example, Barack Obama among others. Uh, and who else? Farmers. Whether it's immigrants trying to get into the U.S. and build that wall you know, on the Mexican border, Muslim immigrants trying to get into the U.S., uh, or the Chinese 
you know, in his mind trying to steal our jobs. This kind of combination. Oh, by the way, somebody else had this uh, going to make America great again. Somebody thought it was pretty simple. So I happen to just happen to see this. I thought I'd share it with you. All you need to do is put these guys back. By the way, I don't, I don't actually agree with this, but I thought it was a, a cute t shirt. Just put them back in all the shape of our grid and tell me what you think about it. So, what's Trump's solution? Put America first. He thinks all policies should prioritize the United States American citizens under the assumption that in the past, America has been pursuing soft hearted policies to help others. Whether they, these are illegal immigrants or foreigners, such as the Chinese. Now, I think this view is, is incorrect. I don't think the US government, uh, I think we do give foreign aid and so on, but I think it's often quite strategic. And, um, and uh, so I, I don't accept the idea that, that the American government has just been doing things for the sake of people outside of the United States, right? Which is, but that's, you know, a lot of the Trump supporters, that's what they feel, they're being ignored. And uh, our leaders, our elites, are only helping others. This may be uh, you know, poor people in the United States, they may be immigrants trying to get into the United States, or they may even be the Chinese. But somehow our leaders really went off the rail, and they're, they're doing all these, having all these policies that support others, but not us, not Americans. And then I think that's not correct. That's the belief, and it's more widely held, particularly among uh, Trump supporters. So it has a very powerful appeal as people try to understand themselves in the changing world. Um, so what does this mean? For free Trump, not getting into foreign wars, such as wars of choice like Iraq, um, asking NATO to pay more for defense, creating con conflicts actually between the US and uh, long-standing allies, tougher trade policies, which we're, you know, right now we're having the whole question of whether the United States and China are able to negotiate a very important uh, trade agreement. Um, domestically cutting back on immigration, uh, the, you know, the focus, so much of Donald Trump's time and energy is going to decide to build a wall between the United States and Mexico to keep out the immigrants. Make America first. Gives a sort of a little bit of a joke on the wall. Uh, Trump has extolled the Chinese, saying, look, look what they did. They built this uh, really great wall. And he said that, that was even before they had uh, uh, caterpillar, you know, uh, tractors and, and, uh, and uh, digging devices and all the rest of it. Of course, what Trump doesn't know is the last Chinese dynasty, which lasted 268 years, was run by Manchurians, who at that point had gone right around the Great Wall back in 1644 and took over China. So the last Chinese dynasty actually wasn't Chinese. It was Manchuria. Now China since then has, of course, absorbed Manchuria. Um, so the wall didn't work then. And of course, somebody cracking wise over there said, China built a wall and they have almost no Mexicans. So the uh, a little ironic humor here with regard to my president. All right, so why, why, why is, uh, Trump, is Trump an exceptionalist in his own way? Well, uh, President Trump claims to, uh, not to believe in American exceptionalism. What he's doing is he's, he's stripping it there to look, pretty much raw power relations. He downplays down ideals and suggests basically we have to get the bare knuckle transactional arrangements in which the United States, through ability, willpower, and leadership, will win. In a fair competition, Trump believes, the United States must win. Because that's his explanation as to what, why, why isn't the United States doing as well? Because of foreigners and bad leadership. So, so in a fair competition, foreigners cheating and bad leadership allowing foreigners to treat and giving away the store. So why is it that America uh, uh, isn't great anymore with Trump? It's because of these failures. If we correct these failures, America is destined to win again in a fair competition. But why? Why is America destined to win in a fair competition if it's, it's not something about America that Trump believes is exceptional? See? So hidden in his rhetoric, I think, is, is a Trumpian version of 
American exceptions. Still believes America is destined for greatness. But the fight has to be fair. It can't be cheated. Now, here's the dangerous question. If this fails, whose fault is it? If it fails, whose fault is it? Now, this idea of victimization, that is that it's foreigners, uh, bad leadership, that causes our problems, it also plays a very important role in China, the Chinese ideas about their own exceptions, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, now, we need to remember that uh, Adolf Hitler also used the idea of victimization as a powerful, uh, you know, uh, stimulant for Nazism in Germany. In other words, the idea that it becomes a very toxic group for authoritarianism. Why? Well, the nation is being stabbed in the back. The nation is being stabbed in the back. The German people, the great German people were stabbed in the back. They were stabbed in the back in World War I. That's why we had this horrible Versailles Treaty, Versailles Treaty, and so on. Well, you know, Trump is saying, of course, it's not the same thing. It's not, but there's something here. And, and then the Chinese in their own way, it's probably a very common way of explaining failure. But it's dangerous because it can lead to political movements, first called populist, later become more outright fascist. And some Americans are quite worried about that. So uh, in the end, Donald Trump must believe that America is entitled to win in the competition it enters. Therefore, while he says it's not nice to talk about American exceptionalism, I believe he believes in it nonetheless. Again, the danger, what happens if America doesn't prevail? The losing can only come about because it was unfair. It was subverted by others. Dangerous belief to democracy. Let's uh, now talk a little bit about uh, China and Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has talked uh, on many occasions about the specialness of China. This is one example. And what's, what's interesting about Xi Jinping is he, he, um, he sort of combines the idea of China being special because of its communist heritage, communist party heritage, but also China being special because of its Chinese heritage, which of course goes back into the imperial period. So for example, Confucius has been resurrected in China in a way that one, one can't imagine having happened in the Mao or under the Cultural Revolution in China. So his, uh, his view of history is quite different than Mao's. There's a, uh, just a representation of Xi and Mao in the background. We in the Communist Party are from Marxists in our party's guiding thought is Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, and socialism with Chinese characteristics. But at the same time, we're not historical nihilists, that is, we're not going to knock ourselves down. And we're not cultural nihilists. We cannot be ignorant of the history of our own country, and we cannot belittle ourselves. One major way in which this idea of Chinese exceptionalism has been expressed through, uh, by uh, uh, Xi uh, is through the idea of the Chinese dream, which he has popularized. It's not his phrase, but he popularized this phrase. Um, as one scholar put it, this appeals to many people in China, this idea. Both uh, you know, a good middle class life and a return to China's prominence on the world stage. According to Xi, and these, are, these words I hear are quite important. The Chinese people must work tirelessly to realize the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. Those words there, national rejuvenation, are quite important. Because that's a very important motivating factor in China. China's, China's back. China was great once, and we're going to make China great again. Very, you know, again, this, I know this is a lot to kind of throw out quickly. But the idea of Chinese exceptionalism, which is background for the Xi's thinking. Um, just quickly, the imperial period, the idea that China, which 
called the Chinese uh, Tianxi, the idea of the underhead. China, the, the word China in Chinese jungle uh, literally means um, a, a, a middle kingdom or country. It's the country underhead in the middle. Everything else, as you go further from China, you're more likely to become a barbarian. The closer you are to China, the more likely you are to be civil. So this idea of China's centrality in the world. By the way, the Chinese word for America in Chinese is beautiful country. So at least we, uh, we can see that actually these tiles of Chinese have been both countries uh, this idea of exceptional qualities to them. So the imperial uh, period, this idea of being under heaven, um, the idea, and again, you know, so a big part of this is mythology. The idea that China uh, has this preeminent moral authority through Confucianism and other ways of thought, uh, which includes a benevolent pacifism, that is China, by its nature, is not an aggressive country. It's not an imperial country in the sense of going off to conquer new lands and take colonies as the West had done. Um, and that, uh, including others in its relationships, that is inclusive, the idea of it being inclusive. In the revolutionary period, that is, uh, you know, in the period of the 30s, 40s, and, and 50s, um, for now, China should leave the third world because China um, was a victim of imperialism. China was once a great power, and because its own principles are based on um, universal ideas, um, and that China will not abuse its power, China should leave the third world. And then in the contemporary period, a number of ideas which bring this kind of all together in a more modern way. The idea that China will break from the violent paths of other rising powers, break power reformism, that is contrary to the Thucydides track that we talked about before. China is a rising power that can rise peacefully. Not like Germany, it lies peacefully. Um, because China assimilated other cultures rather than oppressing them, China will pursue a peaceful foreign policy. That, and that China will be inclusive of others, the idea of harmonious inclusionism. That China will make accommodations with other countries. But still, that somehow China is going to be at the center of all of this. So the New York Tianxi. One of the great motivations for China uh, is, uh, is nationalism. Um, uh, the idea that China is an exceptional nation in culture, and it always has been, enjoying uh, maybe a third of the world's gross domestic product back around 1800, but then being subject to what they call a century of humiliation really starting with the Opium Wars, and being relegated really to a third or fourth rate power, even if that, by the Europeans and by the Japanese. And yet, you see some of the, just some of the things that the Chinese, have on their list of particulars of the abuses that have been visited on, with particular scorn for the Japanese to this day in China. This is just a sort of cartoon of the unequal unequal trees carving up China. You can see if you read this, uh, America, Uncle Sam there, Germany, and I won't go through all the names, but all of these countries being represented here. Um, what is the consequence of this idea of exceptionalism for Xi and for Chinese, uh, what Chinese believe uh, today? If China is an exceptional country in the way Xi and others argue, then it can be trusted in foreign, uh, by foreign countries to work for mutual benefit of others, not just for its own self-interest. In other words, unlike the Americans and unlike the British before them, we're going to rise peacefully and not only that, the things we do in the world economically and diplomatically are going to be in your benefit as well as ours. We're not going to colonize you. We're not going to take advantage of you. We're not going to put you up to an international liberal order that can meet your needs. We're going to create something for our mutual benefit. 
How do we know? Well, because we're exceptional. Because that's the nature of Chinese culture. So it can be trusted to be very vicious call goals both domestically and internationally. So here are just some of the some of the very, very, very ambitious goals and actually activities that are being undertaken. The Belt and Road Initiative, really to hook up the old Silk Road training, but we can go well beyond that. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which a lot of uh, American allies are, are, are participating in. Uh, the, the development, the, the, the carving out uh, of the right to and the development of islands in the South China Sea, which are, if you look at the map, Chinese have, uh, I didn't make a slide, the Chinese have something called the Nine Dash Line. The Nine Dash Line is a line of what China believes it's in its own territorial uh, 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 region. And this line goes a lot closer to other countries, for example, like the Philippines, than it is to China mainland. So it's quite interesting just to look at it and to imagine, how did the Chinese think this is theirs? What, what is going on here? But, but, that, but they're doing that. And as you know, in a very muscular way, they've been carving out these territories. And there's been conflicts. They've lost a, a, a law to suit with the Philippines. And the U.S. is constantly sailing its navy through there to, to contest this idea of of this being Chinese territorial waters. And then also uh, developing a China model that maybe some other third world and other countries will wish to emulate in the future as America's star fades. A China model of development with a different kind of government. Maybe author, a Chinese style of authoritarian government or a Chinese idea of real democracy, you know, so, which is very different than what's American liberal democracy. And then uh, internally, uh, some things like she eliminated the, uh, the two-term rule as president. You know, the Chinese had their constitution, you can only be president for two five-year terms. That's, that's been taken out by the Xi. She is arguably the most powerful leader in China, certainly since Deng Xiaoping, without question, possibly since now. Vigorous anti-corruption campaign. You know, one thing when you do when you go after corruption, uh, and uh, even if you do it in the most sincere way, I'm sure a lot of uh, Xi's political enemies have been uh, targeted not, and, and less of his friends. But one thing you certainly do when you have an anti-corruption campaign, you make a lot of enemies. So it's not an easy thing to do, and it's quite a political reason thing to do. But, but he's, he's, he's doing it. Um, slowing economic reform, that is slowing market economic reform, putting more uh, emphasis on the state sector, which many in America, when they sold the other Americans on the idea that China should join the World Trade Organization, um, many uh, the argument was China would ineluctably become liberal economically and politically. Well, has, as you know, it hasn't become liberal politically. In fact, if anything, politically it's more impressive than what I said 10 years ago. Um, of course, in other ways, the Chinese society has opened up in, in very interesting ways. Uh, and uh, in more recent years, some people have argued that the reform process has stopped. Now, there's a lot of debate on Chinese scholars uh, on this. But uh, still, moving in a different direction. And then these two centennial goals, doubling the per capita GDP to about $10,000 in a couple of years per year, um, which would, I think, uh, raise China to the next level of nations, that is, nations who are no longer poor. And uh, that's, uh, that's the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party, 1921, so 2021. And the second centennial or anniversary, 100 year anniversary, is to become a fully developed, rich, and powerful nation of 2049, the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, 1949. Now, not everyone is, you know, buys into uh, the Xi Jinping's arguments about Chinese exceptionalism or about the Pacific nature of China. And here are a couple of harsh assessments from uh, the U.S. on the bottom, and then also from, uh, from uh, uh, Great Britain. Um, Callahan argues really what the China goal, dream is, is the goal of returning China to its imperial glory, essentially. Where, you see this quote here, right? Eurocentrism is replaced by Sinocentrism, Westernization is replaced by Easternization, American exceptionalism is replaced by Chinese exceptionalism. Whereas uh, Elizabeth Economy puts it, 
Xi Jinping sits on top of the Communist Party, the Communist Party sits on top of China, and China sits on top of the world. So there you go. Egypt, pick a side. All right, what, what are the differences between these ideas of exceptionalism? Um, America, the idea of a liberal republic, self-conception of a country that's a beacon to the world, a guide to accept the values of America because of its special role. It's, it's able to give us these values because it's a special place, and the world should embrace these values. And the, and the idea that the world is capable of embracing these values. That is, these values are universal values. See, therefore, anybody can be like America. It's not cultural in that sense, at least not in self-conception. Now, of course, this has been hotly debated in the United States. Uh, you're probably aware of the famous book, The Clash of Civilizations, by Samuel Huntington, who argues against this idea. Certain, certain civilizations will never be, uh, will never be able to adopt the values that the U.S. has. And actually, one of the ones he points out is China. It's China will never be able to adopt liberal Western values. It's just not what China's all about. But nevertheless, this is, a, this is a, an important idea in our exceptions. The idea this is universal. That's why, why do you invade Iraq? Well, maybe one of the reasons is to promote Western style democracy. Or why do the U.S. stay in Vietnam, get involved in Vietnam? Well, at least in terms of what the argument that was made to promote democracy in this country. Western style. Okay. Chinese exceptionalism, somewhat different, of course. You're not China has a unique culture. That is, now, this is where it gets a little tricky. It has been able to embrace a form of Marxism. And then the putting together of these two things, which are quite, in some ways, now we thought, contradictory. Somehow, modern China has put this together in a way that's unique and different. Therefore, it would be, it's going to be a powerful country, it's going to be true, true democracy. And it's going to be a country that will rise along with others to the mutual benefit of all. So what are the differences? What are the differences between these? Um, I think the idea of American uh, 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 focusing on exceptionalism just to, in a sense, review, is we have a situation in the world now with many, many different problems and conflicts. But among them, one of the most important is potential conflict between the United States and China, just because of the power of each country, uh, economically and also militarily, and so on. What is it about, uh, now, there are conflicts of interest between these countries, and, for example, over trade that's being hammered out right now. But there are also, differences in, way, in the ways each country sees itself and sees itself in the world. These cultural and political differences can also become an ingredient for harmony or for tension. So what I'm simply trying to suggest today really is, does this idea of exceptionalism, which I think both countries in different ways, hold on to, at least to some important degree, will these ideas themselves become additional arenas of tension that when things get out of hand, make the situation more problematic than it might have otherwise been. And I think, I think they are. I'm not claiming these are the central problems between the two countries. But I am claiming that because of the power of these two countries, that this political cultural agreement could push things in the wrong direction at just the wrong time. And I think, you know, there are many examples of that in the history. I mentioned World War I was that a good example of a, a war that probably, I don't know, maybe never should have happened, but it, it, it's what, you know, in retrospect, you can't, why, why did they do that? But, but it happened, you know what happened. So hopefully this, we won't have something like that. I don't think it will, but I think we need to know all, all of the factors that are involved. So I just suggest this is one of the factors, not necessarily the most important one, but one of the we need to do. Thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, kind attention. Dr. DeLuca, uh, thank you for 
what I thought was a, a very insightful uh, presentation that uh, shed light on an aspect of the relationship, the U.S. Chinese relationship, uh, which we don't often think about, uh, which is the role of political culture and, and this idea of exceptionalism. Um, it, if I can make, maybe start uh, just with a quick question, sure. and then I think we have time uh, to take questions from the, from the floor. If you could talk a little bit more about the linkage between political culture and policy. On the US side, at least, we've seen how the notion of American exceptionalism has been translated into different policy approaches with respect to China. We've seen the uh, Obama uh, approach of trying to integrate China into the rules-based international order right, to enable China's uh, peaceful rise. Just to have China follow the rules, as of course uh, that have been set by the West. Uh, so that was uh, one approach. We've seen the uh, approach adopted by the Bush administration, which was a very uh, 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 tough, muscular uh, containment approach uh, towards uh, China, o also animated by the sense of American exceptions. Uh, and then we see, of course, a, a, as you've shown quite well, the uh, sort of mercantilist transactional approach adopted by the Trump administration um, with respect to China, that also deriving from a certain sense of American exceptions. Um, so we've seen these different policy approaches. Um, how have these approaches been influenced by um, notions of political culture, uh, not only with respect to how the United States views itself, but how it views China's place uh, in the world. Yes. Um, that's a very, very important question, very good question. Um, I, I think uh, we see, we're seeing two kinds of strands of American political culture. If you remember when I, I mentioned about how uh, President Obama was criticized because he talked about exceptionalism as if you know, every country in the US has its exceptional qualities. You have the more, I, I, for lack of a better term, the more liberal and more conservative way of doing this. Um, and so I think that there was a, a, a lot of optimism among the liberals in China, and also, quite frankly, among the many conservatives in China being the liberal order. To some degree, it has been. But there's also been some among some conservative skepticism uh, as well. Uh, and I think George W. Bush was uh, more skeptical, but we also got on board, got on board the China train. In fact, if anything, Barack Obama, with his pivot to Asia, uh, uh, made the Chinese nervous. Uh, you know, what Bush had done was bought the United States down in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, one of Obama's objectives was to say, you know, that's not really the real problem or the potential problem might be in Asia. We have this rising power, we need to shift our focus there. Um, and so I think that, um, uh, but, but both, you know, uh, had this idea of the U.S. being the indispensable power that needs to leave. And so in that regard, I think they both were very, very similar with regard to China. And I think actually in his own way, uh, Trump, Trump is a problem. So I think the political cultural idea is how you explain this to the public. Like what, what, what do you tell the public about why you're doing what you're doing? And I think for all of these presidents, you basically in different ways saying that uh, China has to play by the rules. They don't play by the rules. You know. And then of course they're assuming America always plays by the rules. Right? If China doesn't play by the rules, then they have to react in some way. And so you get very different reactions by extreme administrations. Thank you. Um, why don't I, why don't we take a round of questions uh, from the floor and maybe uh, address them uh, together, uh, just in the interest of time. Um, questions from the floor? Allison. I have, when, we had some interactions with some faculty from China a few years back, mm -hmm. and they, in relation to conflicts in Africa in particular. And one of the things that they raised, the Chinese faculty raised in that meeting was a sense of a foreign policy aversion to messy situations. 
and kind of raising the idea that even though a lot of countries in this region in particular would like to see greater foreign policy involvement on the part of China as a counterweight to the United States, that China itself would be very reluctant to engage in situations where it wasn't certain of the outcome and where it could conceivably get burned, so to speak. And I'm just wondering your, your thoughts on, on that observation, whether you see that as being consistent or whether as China increases in power, uh, both economically and politically, it might be more willing to take on these messy situations. Um. Well, I think China is probably right now in some messy situations. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's basically correct, though. Uh, but, but China will make a calculation of, in other words, what do they get out of this relationship? So what are the resources that they get? You know, or what do, is it an investment that will be paid, paid back? Uh, um, some people are, are concerned that uh, uh, people who uh, take Chinese investments will get stuck in a debt trap. So that's a whole other issue from sort of the Africa or other, other parts of the, the other side of this. Just as many countries, for example, South America got stuck with an uh, international monetary fund, a debt trap some years ago. So I think these are all real concerns. But I think the Chinese will be calculating about it. And I think it's, I don't think it's going to be a problem for the vote for them. But I think these initiatives are very ambitious and they are going to push forward. Uh, they're not, as you know, much concerned about the human rights records in these countries. But the U.S. hasn't always been either. I, mean, you know, I won't mention any names right now, but you know. So, uh, but, uh, but that's not a, that's not even really a factor very much, unless it becomes messy. But it's not really a factor for them. It is in the U.S. to some degree because there's more political pressure here. But um, but, I, but I think they will do it if it's in their interest, uh, and they'll calculate if it's the mess is worth it. And if it's worth it, they'll do it. If it's not worth it, they won't, they won't do it. At least that would be their goal. In other words, I think they're going to be very, like Donald Trump, they're going to be very transactional. That was important. Because that sounds like... It's not going to be ideological. Exactly. I don't think. And not more so much as sort of a... No, they're trying, they're they're trying to spread transaction. their influence, but, yeah. but, they're, uh, but also, they, you know, the bottom line is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Susan Sherrick some years ago, a former State Department person, uh, wrote a book called Ch uh, China, a uh, uh, Fragile Superpower. Mm -hmm. And um, that is the idea that and this book is like 10 or 11 years old now, but I think the basic point is not wrong, even though China's become more powerful, which is that China from the outside looks like a behemoth, an unstoppable behemoth, but the Chinese leadership themselves know how careful they have to be in so many ways. That is, there are thousands of protests and demonstrations going on in China all the time, of the various grievances. These are not Tiananmen Square, these are not political, but they're very dangerous. For example, the Sichuan earthquake some years ago, that was that was a very threatening thing for the Communist Party, the incompetence, which the buildings were not people that were killed. That's, politically, that's very dangerous. So the Chinese are very aware of that. And so, uh, you know, China, uh, as you know, uh, Marxist ideology, communist ideology is actually making a bit of a comeback, but it's really not the legitimating rule in China. It hasn't been for quite a long time. But what is is nationalism and economic growth. And if you lose economic growth, which China is doing, I, mean, not, I say losing it, it's slower than it used to be. The debate about what, what it really is. If you lose that, how do you gain support for rational nationalism? That gets dangerous, too. So they, so they have to be very careful. They have tons of money, right? But they, some of their local governments have tons of debt. And they're balancing the state owned enterprises that are quite unproductive, employ lots of people. This is enormous balancing. So, anyway. I don't know if I've answered your question. Maybe you move, uh, Robert. So I have a couple of points. Um, just thinking out loud, really. I wonder if it is one of Chinese exceptionalism <clears throat> or simply a growing sphere of international influence. <coughs> it's quite hard to differentiate the two. And uh, there might be a transition, I think, at, one, at some point. I mean, we've got the five principles of peaceful coexistence dominating current thinking in the moment, but perhaps the policies will adjust you know, at a later point in time. Uh, another technical point on your presentation, do you know if they're actually achieving the, um, the growth to $10,000 per capita? I think they're, they're, I think they're actually getting that. I think so, maybe even a little higher than that. Okay, so that's... Which I think is, I think there are cutoffs, I think this moves you into the very low realm of the 
uh, of the uh, wealthy economies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, by the time the U.S. Uh, is like sixty thousand uh, dollars. By the way, China, you know, is, but in terms of purchasing power, China uh, argued uh, uh, argued that it surpassed the United States in terms of the size of its economy, not in terms of not what's called nominal you know, GDP, the actual dollar amount, but in terms of per capita uh, uh, economic uh, output. China is quite still 100 or something like that. It's quite relatively low on the list of countries. So that's another thing to keep in mind. But yes, I, I think they have. Uh, I think they're doing well on that. I think the real question now is what is China's real growth and what is it like to, likely to be over the next 10 years? And there's a lot of debate about that. And there's a point about uh, cultural uh, culture is exacerbating tensions and yeah. conflict. I'm not so sure about this because I, I wrote a, a paper at LSE on uh, China's engagement in Sub-Saharan Africa, comparing it with the British and the Turkish. And actually, there's evidence to suggest that you know, they're actually going through a period of international social socialization and they're supporting a lot of the uh, local um, projects and uh, international uh, attempts to, to manage things like development and so on. So uh, for me, it's, uh, it's not so much of an issue. The, the role of culture in, uh, of in China's the culture in the Europe versus the US, yeah, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, China has actually I think, contributed a lot of peacekeepers in the UN and so on. So there, there, I mean, there are signs of China being sort of a, a good stakeholder, as they like to say, right, in, in certain regards. But of course, you know, the US and other, many other countries and businesses, you know, businesses uh, were falling in the mouth to get into China going back, you know, 100 years. But, uh, but a lot of businesses are very frustrated with doing business in China. American businesses, I'm sure British, European businesses. Uh, intellectual property, I mean, you know, all this intellectual property, all of these kinds of questions. Uh, uh, security, cyber security. Uh, so these are real issues too. So, uh, but, 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 you know, it's, a, it's, it's not a all one piece that you're pointing at. Yeah. We have our, what I think is the last question from the back. Uh, so I said that it's about Chinese both towards China, right? And like a part of the Chinese exceptionalism yeah. is like when uh, the countries that work with China would have mutual benefits. Right? That's, 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 uh, that's what they think. Do you think like the countries would, which will work, make alliance on the road and build initiative will have really mutual benefits or uh, it's a trap? <laughs> I think it's false. I mean, it's both. I mean, I think China, I don't think Chinese, when they say that, are lying. I think they believe that, but I also think they're going to put Chinese interests first. They have to, at least to a large degree, just because, especially if people like Xi or Wai, you know, the Chinese uh, government, the ruling political system, is not quite as, uh, you know, uh, invulnerable as it looks from the outside, that they, you know, they have to put Chinese self-interest first, at least to a large degree. So I think it's uncertain, you know, but um, I mean, it wouldn't su surprise anybody to see the Chinese take advantage, as every other country does take advantage of uh, weakness, exploit resources, so we'll see. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet all my money on uh, um, the Chinese being true, uh, you know, but benevolent inclusion of others. But, uh, but I think they believe it. I think they believe it. It's very much part of this idea of the peaceful rise, which um, has been part of the Ch Chinese talk for quite a long time. Professor De Luca, uh, on behalf of the Center for American Studies and the, the, the Study Center, I want to thank you for a very illuminating talk. I think you uh, put this very complex relationship into a very interesting perspective for us. Uh, please thank me. Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Thank you all for being great audience.